This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome to another program in our Exploring Ethics series. Um, I'm Mike Kalichman. I'm the director for the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology, and also a professor um, at UC San Diego. Um, the Ethics Center, for those of you who are newer to the center, has a mission of trying to bring the public and scientists and other academics together to hear about and identify and better understand new science tech and technology areas that could have a profound impact on our lives. Because of that, many of these areas have issues that come up in the process of doing the research that are really ethical issues. Are there things we should not be doing? Are there things we should be doing differently or could be doing differently? And other issues come up once a technology has been developed. Are there things we don't want applied or we want them applied in different ways? All of which raise questions that are often, unfortunately, not thought about in advance by the scientists because they haven't been part of conversations like this and often the public has been part of those conversations. So our hope is that this will be an opportunity for members of the public to be part of that conversation and help us all to do a better job of the science that's coming down the line. So I want to introduce now tonight's speaker, um, Leanne Tchaikovsky, um, who I uh, met fairly recently and coincidentally realized that some of the work she's doing would be perfect for our program because it's so exciting. She has a long-standing interest in eye movements and developmental disorders and the brain and neuroscience in general. Um, she has served as Assistant Science Director for the Autism uh, Society, uh, Autism Speaks group for uh, about three years, I believe, um, and is a member of the Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center at UC San Diego. For tonight's program, she's going to talk about some work she's been doing that I think raises a variety of ethical questions, arguably both at the research stage, how should we do these studies, and at the stage of application. So I want you to join me in welcoming uh, Leanne to talk about those topics. Well, thank you all for coming out this evening and attending. I see some familiar faces in the audience. Uh, could be from research or could be from uh, my being out in the autism world here in San Diego for quite some time. So as Mike said, today I'll be talking about uh, some studies that we've conducted using video games to train a particular aspect of spatial attention in uh, adolescents with autism. But I kind of wanted to start with a bigger perspective because the thing that we did with these games, and we did it because we thought it would be more respectful for the families and their time, was to take them into the home. And that has created some really interesting challenges that I thought we'd like to talk about in addition to the video game aspect. So, why go home? Why, why might one want to deliver an intervention, a therapeutic, or what have you at home? Um, West Health is a company here in San Diego who's doing a lot of this for the reason that I highlight in the first bullet, but healthcare costs are super high. And one way to reduce them is to shift rehabilitations and therapies from a clinic environment into a home environment. So it's, it's really, think of it just as a, a true cost reduction mechanism. You can get more people through um, but there are challenges with that, of course, right? So another point is that some of the most effective rehabilitation, and the thing that I'm thinking of because I'm a neuroscientist, is um, some stroke-based rehabilitation called constraint-induced movement therapy. It has been shown time and time again to be extremely effective, but the limiting factor is access to the clinic. We just can't give it enough, right? If we can get it in the home, and you can get it more frequently, then perhaps it would actually be more <laughs> efficacious for more people. So access to the clinic being the second point. The third point is that travel is difficult for many people, many people who are in need of rehabilitation, many people who are seeking multiple different types of services and have a very impacted schedule going to yet another thing that must be done on a regular schedule is an extra burden. So travel, 
as a, the third thing of, of many potential that I see is a good reason to take an intervention into a home. And I'm speaking very broadly here. So just throwing out some other uh, comments. Why not, of course, uh, there's, a, there's the other side, why not go into a home? Well, as I've seen personally, and I'll share a few little stories, um, inviting technicians or researchers into your home for setup and monitoring creates some privacy concerns. I've certainly seen a few things that I would have rather not see. And I think that they have shared things that they would have rather not share with me because you know this is their home and this is, this is just where they, they live their lives. And <laughs> we didn't necessarily expect that level of, uh, of contact. Um, having a therapeutic in your home can create some kinds of, of stress and anxiety because it's there and it's calling you to engage it. You should, you should really be practicing, you should really be doing your therapy again and again and again. And for some people, particularly those who are given to anxiety, this can cause a lot of stress. And in another case, um, you, might, you might consider, and this is more of a research or empirical question, that the lighter monitoring in home-based studies may not be safe or certainly as not, not as efficacious as something in the clinic. And that's something that's you know, partially an ethical concern, but partially also an empirical question. OK, so that's, that's what I wanted to share with you as sort of the big picture view. And now I'd like to funnel a little bit more down to our studies with autism. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, chances are a lot of you are here because you're, f you're familiar with autism. I personally have a family connection with autism. It's what got me into this research. But I'd like for us all to start with a, you know, just a general, what is autism? First of all, it's a behaviorally defined disorder. There is no blood test, fingerprint, nothing biological um, that is diagnostic to say, yes, this individual has autism, this does not. That is a major thrust of much research, but we are not there yet. It's one of the spectrum of pervasive developmental disorders. It's neurodevelopmental symptoms appear um, along, they, they, they accumulate in the first two years of life and they have to be present before age three. The, the, the new diagnostics have, have changed a little bit, but that's still generally true. It's far more likely to be seen in boys than girls. This might be an old number, four times more likely. I've, I've seen numbers up to six, depending on how you're diagnosing. Uh, but girls seem to be more severely affected, which is interesting. And it tells us that perhaps the way in which we're selecting our, our behavioral definition, you know, there's an expert that says you have autism, but you do not. It might actually be biased in a way to pick out boys, but girls are just not, um, are present differently and might actually have some challenges that we could call autism, but we're not doing that. So the etiology, what causes autism, is still unknown, but it's likely multiple. We don't believe that there's one thing that causes autism at all, right? And treatment approaches vary widely, biomedical and behavioral, um, some of which have a decent research base and some of which have none at all, but still are garnering a lot of attention in the community. And there's still no known cure, and the word cure is in quotes here because that's in and of itself uh, worthy of an entire ethical discussion. <laughs> so, and uh, certainly the outcomes are very variable. Uh, the autism spectrum is incredibly broad. Um, there, uh, Isabel Rapin, who's the, the grand dam neurologist of uh, autism research, has said that if you've seen one child with autism, you have seen one child with autism. There is incredibly variability, incredible variability in the presentation, but also the outcome. Some individuals being completely nonverbal and will not be independent throughout their lives, and some leading very happy, self-actuated, successful lives. And for better or worse, they all share this large diagnostic category. So this is what we're playing with, OK? So I'd like to, to now focus on my perspective with autism in that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder, and so experience plays a lot into that, and your experience with the world. So as we see this, again, neurodevelopmental disorder, so we think that the brain is developing atypically, circuitry is developing atypically, and that can be thought of as a feedback loop. Your experience is different because you're engaging the world differently, and that actually can drive things off track further, right? And I, and I like this particular slide. It reminds me of work from Esther Talen, who um, thought of development as a dynamical system. I, I really like that view. There's a lot of feedback from what goes on in the environment. And I particularly find movement to be extremely important. And that's one thing that we focus on in um, the RAD lab, the Research for Autism and Development lab, is movement, I think, is, is very different in autism. And um, it's, it's what we're going to use as a sort of uh, handle to harness and change some aspects of cognition. 
So to sort of summarize that more succinctly, we're interested in learning how the eye and body movements come together to produce learning opportunities in the world, or not, as the case may be in some children. So I'm particularly going to tell you about a series of studies that we have done briefly, and then and the intervention study that took us into the home. And I'm going to start by showing you there's a brain, and then floating on top of that brain are various different areas that are involved in specifying eye movement circuits. Uh, sorry, eye movement control, particularly saccadic eye movements. And I'm going to use my laser pointer here. So saccades are super fast eye movements. You actually make four every second. Fortunately, we don't think about those four eye movements we make because there wouldn't be much time for doing anything else. So they are voluntary. You can direct them yourself as the eye movements we use for reading. Um, but this is the circuit that involves the cerebral cortex, which is the outer um, wrinkly uh, part that you look at as the brain, and, and most people think of as the brain, and then the, the nuclei, the thalamus, the midbrain that are, are deeper inside the brain. There are many structures that are connected that control um, the execution of saccades, the specification of where we're going to look next. Okay? And what I want to suggest to you is that Voluntary saccade circuit is actually, you might as well call it the voluntary attention circuit. So the, the redirection of attention is actually a step along the way to specifying saccades. You can think of the saccade as the overt manifestation of a covert shift of attention. So you know, we've all learned that you know, there are some things you're not supposed to look at in the world, and you can look over here and sort of monitor out of the corner of your eye. That is a covert shift of attention. But when you go look at it, that is an overt gaze shift with the saccade. Right? The circuitry for both of those things are shared. And now I'm going to show you a, a couple of quick slides to show that those eye movements, the saccadic eye movements, in individuals with autism, and these are uh, young people, are atypical. So I'm, I'm just using a very, very simple target. We have a, a cross on a video screen and then a circle that comes up. And your job is really to look at the cross in the center, and then as soon as the little Cheerio circle appears, align your gaze with that as fast as possible. So this is, uh, the, in blue, we have the typically developing kids. And in red, we have the ASD kids. And it just takes more saccades to get accurately on target. So think about that for a second. With every eye movement you make, there's a refractory period. Like you have to wait. And then you can make another eye movement. So in a dynamic situation, you're missing information simply because you're not on target. And you have to wait, make another one, get on target. So in, in order to be accurate, and grab that information, you need to be better with targeting your saccades. In addition, the latency to launch a saccade, the time it takes to launch, is longer in individuals with autism. And then this is kind of reflective of, of this, um, this graph, because saccadic accuracy is also um, more error prone in individuals with autism. And that's related to the number of saccades it takes you to get on target. So those are all overt movements, saccades. Uh, I'm just going to show you, and I, I'm not going to take the time to show you what kinds of tests, but these are tests of covert orienting. Uh, two types. One is called an attention network task, which is a wildly boring type of task, but there's an orienting component of it. And here I've got the, the individuals uh, who are typically developing here, and they have got a um, difference score. They're, they're, they're basically able to deal with a greater difference than the individuals with ASD. And then we've got a different kind of task. It's a queuing type of task. And we can see for uh, slow and fast versions of this queuing task, individuals with typical development are just as good. It doesn't matter if they're slow or fast, and they're right up here in the high 90s. But individuals with autism have a performance hit even when there's, a, there's enough time given. 800 milliseconds is almost a second. It's a long amount of time to reorient gaze. But down here at 100 milliseconds, they're nearly at 60%. Okay? So this is just some evidence to show you that you know, we have a problem with orienting behavior. And given that that's how you take in information in your environment, right? when things are fast, and I would like to suggest that social communications and those subtle you know, uh, eye movement gestures that your mom makes when you're young, if you're not picking that up, you're missing things. right? <laughs> I know my sons better pick them up when <laughs> I give them to them. They're in trouble. So, so I, I'd like to put this forward to say it's not just an epiphenomenon. I think that this kind of feedback, this motor you know, failure to capture information in the world, be able to, to engage effectively, socially, is really important. And so we think that if we could train these behaviors better, particularly very young, that we might actually get better, not just attention performance, but better social engagement. Right?
That's the idea anyway. So here is our first attempt. We recognize that kids like to play games. So how about if we make some video games? I've spent a lot of time in the autism community and I'm aware of how much time kids spend in different kinds of therapies. So we thought if we're making fun video games, we should send them home. That was our first, you know, first line. Like we're not dragging kids into the lab for this. We'll do that for a very early pilot study with one or two people, but we're gonna push this out into the home. So we created a series of games and we deliver them on this kind of computer. And now our games are very special because we are not just making standard types of games. You might have heard that action video game play can actually improve spatial attention reorientation. This, there's a lot of, of data on this. It is largely true. Um, there's specific kinds, and what, what constitutes an action video game is very specific, but it's generally integrating over a large area um, and, and having very fast shifts, uh, demanding shifts of attention. So we tried to recreate that, except there's a little tweak. We want you to play these games with your eyes. This is an eye tracker. So, so new technology actually changed the game for us, allowed us to be able to do this at home. The eye tracker I use in our lab is about $30,000. Not sending that home. <laughs> Just not. Um, this is about 100, OK? It's not nearly as nice. Not surprisingly, it's not nearly as accurate. Um, but it's also not bad. It's not bad at all. And we were able to. Once this came out, we worked with the people who made it very closely because it, as it was just coming out and we were trying to do the study and we'd tried multiple other methods and this worked best. So we situate this eye tracker in front of a computer and we put it in the child's home. And we train them to calibrate, which is to sit very steadily and look at uh, dots that appear on the screen so that the computer now knows where they are and where their gaze is and then they go play. So, goes into the home. So now I'm just going to show you um, an example of our games. This is, uh, we've got three games. This is the whack-a-mole game. There's actually some jazzy music here, but I'm not going to, because I didn't, we, we didn't want to distract from our conversation. But that right there is a representation of the child's gaze. It actually happens to me, my child, who is at the time eight, playing this game. And his job is to hit the ninja moles when they pop up. And he's doing a pretty good job. So he's seeing those guys and he's, he's hitting them. There's another component to this game. So, so that, that's fast and accurate identification of the target and getting on target. Um, ac you know, you want to get spot on target quickly and accurately. But the other bit is uh, identifying distractors, things you're not supposed to look at. And there will be a, uh, there was a cue that comes up. And this guy here, we call those professor moles. At UCSD, we don't hit professors, no. So, so professors pop up, and you're not allowed to look at him or you'll lose a life, right? You're not, you're not supposed to do that. In higher levels of this game, so as, as it keeps going, the play gets faster. The moles don't pop up for quite as long. They start parachuting down from the sky, again, taking some of those action video game components so that you're integrating over a wider area. Kids like this game. They don't necessarily like it for six weeks. But um, six to eight weeks was our intervention. But this is a different game that's training a different aspect of eye movement control. This is steady fixation. It was another problem. I didn't show you that data, but it is a problem in, in these kids that they just are very bouncy with their fixation. They, they don't sit still. And that actually also contributes to their being, we think, being unable to make a saccade at the right time. So training this also had good effects with settling down gaze fixation. So, the last game I want to show you is a game called Space Race. This was the kids' favorite game. There's some jazzy music that goes with it. They get to pick a sh their ship. Uh, they unlock new ships. The better they, they, they are, the, the further they play. And the job here, and my son actually isn't this, this good at this game, you have to look ahead of the ship to steer it. See, he's do there he is. He's doing a good job to get it through the green gate. However, if you look at the ship or behind the ship, you can't steer it. And I, I'd like to argue that looking at the ship is the most interesting thing to do. It's the most salient thing on the screen, right? But you need to not do that and instead look at the gate and guide your ship through the gate. That's the only way to do it. So um, this, and it gets faster and faster. The gates get smaller and smaller. Um, and pretty soon he's going to blow up. <laughs> but uh, you know, these games are, are fast and engaging. Um, we needed another. Uh, several of them, I think, to keep kids wanting to play. And that's one aspect of what we're doing at UCSD together with my colleague, Ziping Young. We started a neuro gaming center because we realized we need a community of people to create good games. Um, but that's, a, that's a, perhaps a point for a conversation. We had a little pilot study, which we're uh, preparing to send out for publication now. And we had eight kids, two of whom dropped out. And I'll be happy to tell you more about why they dropped out. That's actually part of the going into the home 
uh, issue, but um, six of them finished. Uh, they were all what we would call high functioning, meaning that they were able to, you know, they were verbal, they were able to come in and play these games and sit still in front of a, a computer for about 20 minutes per session. And so what I'm showing you here is just a little bit of data for each of the six kids that completed this study. And the bars here, the green ones are before and the orange ones are after. And the black lines is just marking um, with 95% confidence typical performance, right? So this is for spatial attention, so that overt attention um, quickly. And this is, this is, yes, before and then after six weeks of training in orange, right? So, and then this is uh, for the duration of fixation. And you can see that everybody improved with these games, right? Now, some of them, and we just didn't pick very well, some of these kids were already quite good, right? Um, and we're, we're getting better now that we're moved into a small clinical trial. That's the first thing we do. We have the screener phase, right? So you're welcome to come into the study because you've got problems with spatial attention and eye movements, but you're not. And so similarly, we improved um, duration of fixation in all but one kid. OK, so quickly, um, transfer to real world tasks. This is where the, the fun stuff is. This is a visual motor integration task that we play with these uh, LED lights that are programmable. And you can put them up on the wall and really look at integration and now transfer from gaze to hands. That's what we're doing as part of our clinical trial. We're also using um, a simulated driving task. We have a little driving simulator in the lab in order to um, to create scenarios that uh, would, would cause some uh, failures of attention. But I think the thing, and uh, this is, this is, we'll let this go because it's almost done. This is a picture, of, unfortunately, of my 12-year-old who thankfully isn't driving yet for that reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, the, so you can create arbitrarily difficult scenarios that are very attentionally demanding with this simulator. And that's, that's why we use it. Um, but we're particularly interested in realistic social interactions. And I like this, this scene because it's really showing how we feed off of each other socially, right? When there's something interesting going on, we look at each other and we sort of look for referencing in where we're looking and pointing. So we wanted to figure out, can we, can we create some kind of um, scenario or test that would allow us to see how that works? before and after this intervention. Did we change the subtleties of that? I don't pretend to think that six to eight weeks of training with my games is going to change social interactions in a team. That's, that's not going to happen, right? However, if we could do this early, early on, maybe it could, right? And maybe, don't know yet, maybe we can actually change the subtleties of the timing. You know, when something happens, maybe you look at it faster, not just on a screen, but in a real social interaction. So we've. Um, adapted these cameras to be synced with each other. These are special, we actually, these are DIY eye trackers <laughs> that uh, we uh, employed code that was written by a group in the Netherlands and uh, put these together. And uh, my colleague, Victor Minces, came up with this uh, computer vision algorithm that identifies faces. We now have it also identifying colors so we could do some more complicated tasks that involve two people but also a game. So creating ways of assessing change in this social domain. So. This whole study has created some really unique situations. And not just in the home, but that's what I'd like to talk about here. So for me, the issues were largely about privacy. Um, I got, and there's, there's one young gal who, um, I, I, I can't help but think of, she's, she's a lovely 17-year-old gal who, um, who saw me as her buddy, but brought me into, purposefully brought me into this antagonistic situation with her father. She was apparently not supposed to be eating in her room. They were concerned about her weight. And so we were in a room because the parents get to choose where to put this computer, and a lot of them choose to put it in the child's room, right? So this young gal had her computer in her room, and she was having some problem with the eye tracker. So I came out to the house to check the eye tracker. Dad comes in, finds a stash of power bars in the room, and now he's, he is upset, right? And I'm there. And this young woman says, I said, you just don't understand. You don't understand what it's like to be hungry and have it be that time in the month. Tell him. I was like, oh. <laughs> like, Thanks. <laughs> so, you know, well, um, so, so there's, there's some really interesting scenarios that can happen around the home. And the parents, I think, feel a lot more connected with you once you've been to the home, you've met all the family, you know the dog, you know, you know. And, and it's just a, it's a little bit uh, less of a distant you know, researcher-subject relationship. And that can create problems, I think. 
Um, pressure to complete task. I told you I'd tell you about the two kids who dropped out. One kid had no, no such pressure whatsoever. In fact, he was a genius. And I, I don't take that word lightly. He is an amazingly brilliant young man. He was making his own things in the basement all the time. He writes his own code, makes his own games, and told us that ours were dull. And he hacked the computer because he was really annoyed that we locked it down so that kids didn't get on the internet to all kinds of sites that they might not supposed to be doing. So he unlocked it. He found the way we were monitoring remotely our files. He said, I could see that you're writing a JSON file into the Dropbox. And, you know, and your games are really boring, by the way. I'm like, OK, we're done here. You know, this is just this is not going to work. So some kids, it's not going to work for. But there was another young man who, unfortunately, he's 11 year old, um, who actually has a lot of anxiety. And that's not uncommon in autism. A lot of these little guys are, are anxious. And he, um, his, his parents voiced that to us. And they were a little bit concerned that, that this game would create more anxiety. And he was getting up at 4 and 5 in the morning to play the game, to make sure that he did it that day. And that was just kind of rocking the family's world. So <laughs> once again, you know, that's done. And, and, and I think, again, that, that could perhaps be mitigated by not leaving it in the child's room. right? So having, having the game in the child's room made it sort of appealing. And if the child wasn't sleeping and woke up, and oh, I could just play this game in the middle of the night. <laughs> not, not that great. So is there any more risk to the fact that we're only monitoring remotely? We can see when they've played. We can see in the remote Dropbox. We could see if they comment and say they have any problems. But I'm not there. I'm not supervising. You know, I have to check to see if they played for three hours straight. That's probably not good. You, know, it's really, you should go outside. You should do something else. You shouldn't be playing our games for that long. And then um, this is not, I don't think, uh, something that's nearly as applicable to our studies, but I'm in the neuro gaming world. And so I've seen some products that come out that really concern me, to be perfectly honest. There's a lot of, of self, uh, you know, ubiquitous EEG monitoring devices, which is fine. If you want to go monitor your brain waves walking around, that's fine. But there's actually now, you can buy brain stimulators. You can go zap, zap, zap yourself. Um, if you want, and um, they're perfectly available. And I, I was at a meeting where the, uh, one of the heads of the company's daughter ended up in the hospital because she just thought this was really cool and it would help her mood. She'd read some paper somewhere that maybe this could help her mood, and she zapped herself literally sick. <laughs> so there are, I, I think that we need to be careful about how we message these things and manage this space, and I think that's very much in the realm of um, the spirit of what we're talking about here. And that is where I'd like to end our formal presentation, but also pointing out that um, this work was done in collaboration with my colleague and the director of Rad Lab, Gene Townsend, and also a wonderfully talented postdoc, Victor Mincies, who's um, contributed to the social gaze analysis. And the, the good folks who made our games, we contracted a, a small gaming company to make our games are called the Angry Troglodytes. But as I said, we're, we're now trying to bring some of that more in-house at UCSD through our Neural Gaming Center. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I think I'm going to get us started again now. So um, looking at some of the questions, some of them I think might be a good precursor to the next one I was going to ask. Um, and uh, the first one is uh, really about defining just generally um, neurodevelopmental disorders and mental illness. So they're asking, what are the differences and similarities between the terminologies neurodevelopmental disorder and mental illness? Wow, that's a good one. Um, so I guess I could answer that on two levels. Um, one is really like kind of a, a finer point. Some people think of them similarly. Um, I do not, because a neurodevelopmental disorder to me means that uh, the brain has um, evolved in this, uh, sorry, uh, de developed in this particular way. The circuitry is different, so the interactions with the world are going to be different. And I distinguish that from mental illness in this class of things that are not necessarily something that happens really early. But then I can be very confusing and say, however, our knowledge of schizophrenia is saying that mm, basically it might actually be a neurodevelopmental disorder that manifests itself in late adolescence and early adulthood, right? Um, so we're finding that a lot of what we think of as mental health disorders obviously have a brain basis. But the more and more we learn about it, that there are things triggers, stresses, um, epigenetics, you know, markers that we can find in the brain that could have started very early. So um, it's semantic in some ways, I would say. But in other ways, it's, it's a division um, for funding. 
practically speaking, right? You know, what you, um, the way in which we get grants to fund our research. You know, some some things that are called neurodevelopmental disorders are different from mental health disorders like bipolar disorder, like schizophrenia is still considered a mental health disorder, depression. Um, but I think the more we take a biological basis to these things, the more we're going to find that there's a lot of common circuitry disrupted that has uh, differences very early on. Yeah, so we have terminologies for diseases that are often still poorly understood. Yeah. And so there may be a lot of overlap in ways we haven't anticipated, but these are these broad categories that we now have that funding agencies use to figure out who gets the money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So um, uh, the next question is, has autism such as we know it always been around or perhaps by another name? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, my view is likely yes. Uh, it, it's always been, at least you know, in, in modern times, there have been uh, instances we certainly uh, have started to identify it as such. Uh, Leo Kanner uh, coined the term autism um, in 1943. Now, people talk about an explosion of autism. There's certainly more being diagnosed, and there uh, is one primary reason for that and perhaps a secondary reason. The primary reason is a change in diagnostics, right? We've actually just brought in what we call autism. Um, and there's a lot more people who fit in that category. However, there have been some studies uh, in, here in California, in fact, that have applied old criteria ab about how we diagnose autism and new criteria to the same cohort. Now, this is kind of hard to do and iffy, and that's not really how we a clinician would diagnose people today because you, you want to have that personal interaction, and obviously you can't with people who aren't in front of you. But um, that explains a large bulk of the difference, but it doesn't explain all of it. So there's something else that um, people think is going on. And you know, what is that? Uh, are, we, are we poisoning ourselves? Are we you know, uh, um, uh, leaving epigenetic marks from a uh, history of engaging different kinds of chemical, what have you, things that don't necessarily just pass away with the generation. They actually leave some sort of um, a lingering mark that gets passed on. And so that's one idea as well, that there's, we're accumulating things in our, genome is not the right way to say it without getting into it, but, but basically uh, the epigenetics is, uh, um, can explain some of that shift, possibly. Yeah, so there's a, a study that I heard described some years ago, and I'm not sure if I've got this entirely right, but I think what they tried to do was ask the question, what is the rate of autism in children that we're diagnosing now and, and using certain diagnostic criteria, and then applying those same diagnostic criteria to adults mm -hmm. um, with the goal of trying to ask, um, are these adults who were born a long time ago um, perhaps carrying autism at the same rate mm -hmm. as the children. And apparently the results were pretty comparable. Does that sound familiar? Are you familiar with that study? I... I'm not really familiar with that study, but I find it interesting because um, there's, there's a lot of things that happen, uh, like that uh, early slide that I showed about experience, right? So, so there's a lot of um, things that one learns in life, whether you have autism or not, that can change a presentation of a yeah. disorder, right? So, so there are... Um, now studies, I think they, they, they started coming out around 2002 from Deborah Fine and her colleagues, showing uh, young adolescents that have, well, let's just say, uh, adolescents that have moved off the spectrum. So they, they were diagnosed very obviously, they're part of research studies, very clear, clean diagnoses when they were young. And then as they came through adolescence, they were not diagnosed as having autism any longer, and now the question is why? You know, what, what's, can we predict who, who does that? And that, that's been a really interesting line of study, and so the two things that have come out of it, that um, the more um, sort of neurological symptoms there are, and actually motor is a, a, one of them, is a, a, a predictor of poor outcome, and also the kids who got more intervention tended to do better. So, um, but I, I can't necessarily speak to the comparison with adults, unfortunately. Okay, good. So, um, so outside of the approach that you're taking to try and work from an eye movement perspective, can you summarize where we are with interventions for autism? What, if anything, is making a change? Yeah, so there's been a tremendous effort to diagnose at a much younger age and intervene at a much younger age. And for the reasons that I try to lay out in the talk, you know, we're, we're, we're doing video game-based interventions, and at this point, um, that's, we're in the realm of, you know, 
late childhood, early adolescence. But we want to try to move that back because we recognize that plasticity is greater in the brain, the ability for change and, and changing circuitry. But um, also, you know, you just accumulate less atypical experience that you have to try to undo, right? If you can, if you can start early. So there are multiple types of behavioral interventions. The Early Start Denver model is one that has actually been studied and validated in infants. Um, that's that's done rather well. Um, there's a number of people who are trying different types of drug studies or combinations of drugs that are used for like. Um, different uh, types of mental health disorders to sort of bring a child into a range where um, sort of in terms of physiological arousal they're more amenable to change and then and then do some behavioral therapy with them. Um, ABA is the most common type of therapy it's called applied behavioral analysis and it's a uh, targeting specific skills and going through very um, uh, repetitive training for those skills uh, one of the problems with it, I mean, it, it can be quite successful. One of the problems with it is that it's, it doesn't transfer very well. It, it tends to not generalize and you know, stick to that one thing that was trained. There's a, an individual who's spent time in our lab who had a thing for bath mats. Um, don't, don't know why bath mats in particular, but this uh, young man needed to learn that, you know, could not, could not touch the bath mats in Target or Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's or and, you know and it was it was each instance was was novel right it wasn't it just a failure of generalization and that's something that we encounter a lot in autism it makes therapeutics challenging and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to target something that's foundational something that's low down to see if we can change the experience you have in interacting with the world because it seems that targeting these high level things don't transfer as much. Okay, good. So the so I. Those interventions have a goal of trying to do something that means a change for that child or individual. And the question I'm going to ask now is kind of a gotcha question, but it's one we've already discussed before, so it's, it's fair. Um, and that is, um, who are we doing this for? So is there any evidence that children who have autism feel that they need something different and need to be different? Or are there children who have been helped in some way and say that they feel better because they have now been changed? That's a fantastic question. And I think that the answer depends on what they're told. <laughs> I mean, we're, really, we're really a product of our environment. So, so, so some, um, there are, okay, so, so there are multiple answers to that question. I have met many, many, many parents and they are as spread on the spectrum as you know, the individuals themselves with autism. And I've met parents who are very much part of the neurodiversity crowd. You know, I, I want to, the world to adapt to my child. There's nothing wrong with the way my child is behaving. And, and, and that's a valid perspective, so long as the child can actually you know, self-actuate and, and really you know, be independent in, in the way in which he or she wants to in the world. right? But then there's the other perspective that you know, when you have a child that is so impacted that they can't toilet themselves, they will never get on a bus by themselves, they will never, you know, that parent is really annoyed to be dealing with these people who are in the neurodiversity perspective, say there's nothing wrong with my child. It's like, well, guess what? There's something wrong with mine. You know, my child will never be able to enjoy the things I'd like uh, for him to enjoy. And so I, I feel that um, in some way that it's a, it's a, because the spectrum is so wide, we have this dichotomy that need not exist, right? And that we end up we end up in the situation where there's this pull. I mean, I think that we can all agree that individuals who um, are not able to decide for themselves, are not able to communicate for themselves, are not able to um, eat or basic body bodily functions themselves, should probably get some help, right? And it's not that the world adjusting to them, they, they have to, but but then you know there are individuals who just are very socially different and awkward, are having difficulty finding jobs, you know, having difficulty doing some other adult transition things, and maybe we should feel very differently about that. And I think I think it's a question of where they are on the spectrum. Yeah. So I I, I want to push on that a little bit more though. So I mean, ultimately, the challenge is should be to know what that individual wants. Now, um, I'm not sure I want, you know, that I want to put aside the convenience or needs, desires of the parents, mm -hmm. but um, 
I think it probably would be important for us to distinguish between whether we are really doing this for the child or for others. And mm -hmm. just to, you know, you may be familiar with a case where parents had a child who was severely disabled, a, 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 a female child, mm -hmm. and decided to have her treated hormonally so she would not grow bigger so they could continue to pick her up. Mm -hmm. And so she would not go through menopause. And so they were, and you could, you, and this child, you could argue, might be benefited by that because they could then stay with their parents mm -hmm. who, as they got older, would still be able to pick her up and move her and have her do things mm -hmm. and wouldn't have to deal with things that would be confusing for her. And even that's a hard question sure. to argue. And I'm not equating that condition sure. with autism. But mm -hmm. No, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's even thornier than that, I guess I would say, because a lot of the ways in which we treat autism, and then I think this is a big issue, is to, um, a lot of it is ABA, and it's to accept my um, direction without question. You know, I tell you to do this, you do this. I tell you to do that, you do that. And it's almost like we train whatever like autonomous decision-making capacity they might want to have out of them. And it's, uh, and obviously that's, that's, a, that's a specific case, but that's such a prevalent therapy that I don't know how you get to the what you know what is it that you want for yourself if that hasn't been a scaffolded discussion you know that's one of the things that we all want to have that discussion with our young people in our lives you know what is it that you hope to achieve in your life what what, what would success look like for you what do you want to do yeah and this is a population mm -hmm. for which um, it might actually be hard to have that conversation in a meaningful way. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. especially well, when they're very young. Language and communication disorders are among the the the, the, the you know, largest uh, problems with autism, and so that kind of articulation might be particularly challenging. So, so I, I think you know, from an ethics perspective, I mean, it's it's important to have this on the table because, as we balance risks and benefits, we have to be as clear as we can about what the benefits are, and then say, well, are those benefits Worth the, with the risks we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so having said that, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the risks and concerns that you had. Um, the first one was um, with this model that you have, this approach, mm -hmm. there's a privacy question as you go in yes. into the homes. So um, could you talk a little bit more about how impossible it would be? I mean, what, what are we talking about in terms of costs either financial or otherwise, to do this so it wasn't in the home to at least do the studies? Because right now you really are not at a, you wouldn't argue that you're at a therapeutic stage, no. you're arguably at a research stage. So um, how much, what, what sort of costs would we be looking at? Sure, so it's not, actually it would be cheaper and easier for us by far to have them come into the lab. I don't need eight different computer systems that I'm deploying out to the home. I don't need you know an army of people who are trained and capable and have cars that can go out and, and deal with uh, various issues. It's mostly me. <laughs> I'd like to have an army of people. <laughs> but um, uh, I think that the real burden comes in recruiting people who want to participate, right? I mean, it, again, I, I try to um, take what I've heard from the community and really reflect it into my research. And people don't want to come in three times a week for this kind of training, which may or may not have good outcomes. I mean, we, we have kids in Temecula, we have kids in Rancho Bernardo, we have kids in Coronado, we have kids in, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to drive out, for me to drive out to the house to put in the computer, and then if there's a problem, I might have to, you know, check one time or go out, but imagine coming three times a week, you know, from wherever you are, that's just ridiculous. It really limits the number of people who can participate. So that's an, I think of it as an access problem and not really a cost problem. In fact, it's cheaper for us to do it in the lab. Okay, so you do have the access problem. I mean, it, I mean, it occurs to me, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but there are at least a couple of other things that might need to be balanced. One is a selection problem mm -hmm. because um, there is probably going to be something different about the family and maybe the child, that feel they can do this. I mean, mm -hmm. they aren't perhaps as overwhelmed in some ways mm -hmm. that they can go and do something else. Or on the other hand, maybe these would be people who are particularly overwhelmed and think, hoping to look for something. But mm -hmm. at any rate, it would be a selected group. It might be different than the average population. Mm -hmm. And the, the other one is that if this was to be of some therapeutic value, 
ultimately probably the way one really would want to do this is in people's homes because of that access issue if you really wanted to reach a large number of people. And it may be a very different result if you did this in a laboratory than if you did it in a home. So yeah, that brings up a really interesting issue. So one of the things that we're, and I, I didn't feel like I had time to delve into it during the presentation, but we're um, working with some colleagues to try to do assessments along the way. So not, right now we're just, we're doing assessments in the lab, a pre, some, uh, for the pilot study we did a mid and then a post. Uh, as I said, kids with autism are very variable when you're looking at them across individuals, but they're also very, um, within themselves, very variable. One day they might be you know, really calm, having a great day, and another day they might, poo, you know, like super, super um, not engaged, do not want to do this, and you know, that affects our data. You know, we really get very, very different data bringing them back um, compared with age-matched kids who are experiencing a typical development. So, how do we manage that? I mean, that's, that's just data quality problem. So can we deliver little bits of our outcome measures, at least some of them at home, where they're more comfortable, where maybe they have, where I hope they're more comfortable anyway, where they have um, more time to do it in, in little bits? And can, can we structure something about uh, interleaving training assessment, training assessment together at home? And will that change? The data will that will that actually make things um, more stable? And so that's actually a study that we're we're looking to do, yeah, because it's I think it's really important. It's a, it's a good question. There's so much variability in these things. Yeah, well, given that variability, um, and given the, your statement about you know, typical versus atypical, mm -hmm. um, if you were to take any of your measurements of saccades, I mean, how many movements um, per minute or whatever, or latencies and just take everybody in the population, including people with autism, mm -hmm. would you see two bell curves, one sort of what we might call typical and the other is atypical, or is it one bell curve and we just have some people that are yeah, out at one got, it's, a, it's a tail, I don't really think it's two curves. There, there is a, a number of people who are looking at um, sort of high dimensional uh, behavioral measures, eye movement and other measures to try to identify individuals with autism um, using these kinds of things. That's not my goal. Um, I think that there are, uh, there are plenty of ways. I, I kind of leave that part to the clinicians. I'm much more interested in intervening. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, that it's, it's more of a tail phenomenon. And there are going to be a lot of people who have differences in eye movement control. And actually, that's something we're exploring outside of autism. Um, individuals who have uh, uh, reading challenges, there's some subset of them who actually have eye movement problems. This is why um, uh, optometry has so much success with vision therapy. I think I could do a, a much better job with my eye tracker than, uh, than with you know, somebody waving something around and saying, oh, your eyes aren't moving quite right. So, yeah. so there's, there's, there's some opportunity, in it, but I think it, it needs to be research-based. I think we, we have to ask the questions, does it actually help? Well, this is a reminder of um, the terminology you hear often in science in some other areas is low-hanging fruit. Mm. We have already gotten the low-hanging fruit <laughs> for most scientific questions. They were easy, and now we're dealing with questions that are often extraordinarily complex. Um, I'm, I want, I'm going to come back to that, but I also want to honor some of the questions we have, because there's a couple that kind of get back to this issue of what we are now doing in terms of education, um, and even more questions. Um, uh, so one is, are there programs being used in special education schools such as Terry? I don't know if that... Ah, yes. So, so Terry's a great place. Um, I don't... I mean, I'm sh certainly that they are doing um, different types of intervention, and the interventions are almost always tailored to the individual and their particular needs. I don't personally know um, what they're doing at the moment, it would depend on you know which individual you're talking about. But my games are not at a place like Terry. Um, what I am trying to do is work with uh, some schools to get them into special education in a school. Um, I think that's a good first pass. And again, working with people who are um, are younger, but um, that is there's a lot of things that I think can and should be done there. Uh, we we did uh, I showed you the driving simulator. The National Foundation for Autism Research funded that driving simulator and a study that we did for young adults on the spectrum who want to learn how to drive. And we did some light training, driving simulator training, and looked at some pre-driving skills, attention, motor skills, various different things before and after, as well as their driving performance before and after. Did it help? 
And by and large, we showed that particularly if you had attention problems, the six weeks of driving simulator training did help. And we would like to see more simulators out in the community. I don't think you need to have autism to start on a driving simulator before you get into a car. I think it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but that's the kind of thing that's very practical. It feels good. It's not, it's not um, painful or hard. It's kind of fun. Our kids really, kids, young people, enjoyed coming in to do this driving training because that's a, that's a huge landmark in a young adult life, right, is to drive independently. And that's what they wanted to do. And so this was something that we were helping them scaffold. Yeah, good. So, um, so related to that is something that um, I'm going to consider a brilliant question because I thought of it even as I asked a question of you earlier and they followed up on it. Okay. Um, so, but I didn't ask it. Now we are going to. Um, so I was making the case that maybe ultimately we want to do this in the home anyway, so that's where you should be testing it. This person asks, I think appropriately, instead of implementation um, at home, well, actually, they go on to say, or at a facility lab, mm -hmm. wouldn't the eventual best way to access and treat autism with your video games would be in the public schools? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what about doing this in schools? Right. So I was approached from uh, someone in the Vista School District about um, doing this, and I would very much like to. I think that two things, and, and one of them is just really sad and pathetic, and, and you should be appalled at my reason for why not doing that, and it's actually funding. Um, but it's, you know, I have to go to a totally different place in order to get funding to do something in schools. Um, it's not that I don't want to go to that. It's really just a uh, where do we go first. We really need to finish this trial. And then I think as that wraps up, we can go into schools. But I do think that that's a good place to be. The kids are there anyway. There was a different type of intervention that we ran a pilot of that I think would be particularly appropriate in schools for adaptive PE. And it was to train balance. And that's something that uh, a lot of schools actually already have the equipment that they need in order to do some balance training. Again, training the motor system to improve cognition. Um, so I, I definitely think that that's a great way to go because these kids are in schools. And you could target schools with a high proportion of individuals with autism. The next question I'd like to ask is, is a reminder of how complex things are. It, and it's sort of putting together a question somebody asked with a, a broader question. The question that they're asking is, is there an age limit as to how young this can be helpful? Mm -hmm. But before you answer that age limit question, well, actually, why don't we first talk about what you know so far about your ability to improve performance in your SACAD test? Mm -hmm. So um, I actually do get to talk to a lot of teachers. My other passion is education. So trying to bring neuroscience and what we know about the brain into educational practice. Um, and when I talk to teachers, I'm often alarmed. Not, not, it's really just because of some of the, the ways in which they've been trained. Because by and large, the, the teachers who come to these things obviously really, really are passionate and want to, to do the very best for their students. But some of them have been told that there are certain kids that they just can't help. Forget it. There's nothing you can do. Um, there's no plasticity there. Um, the concept of the change in the brain, that is not true. <laughs> the brain is always plastic. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care what is going on uh, diagnostically with you. There is always the ability to learn, right? You know, the, the, uh, we, we, can, we, we study learning in aplesias. We study learning in horseshoe crabs. We study learning in, you know, there are very few neurons working there. You've got a lot more. And it's, sometimes it's harder to figure out exactly how. Um, but th there's plenty of learning, and there's a, a really good um, body of research out of my colleague's uh, lab, Adam Ghazali, on using neurogaming in older adults for training um, sort of dual task performance that transfers to a lot of working memory tasks. And he has, for those of you in the audience who might fall into this uh, age range, he has this particular task, and he, does, he studies kids from, from 20, or you know, teens 20, all the way up into their 80s. And he has this graph, which is sadly depressing. You know, here's your, here's your excellent performance in your 20s, and then it trails down. But, the, but they, they took this group of people um, between, I think, 60 and 75, and they trained them up on this dual task game. And their performance shot up above the 20-year-olds. And six months later, it was still there. And it created transfer. So there, there is a lot of power to some of these, when you know what you're doing to these neuro games, and there's a lot of plasticity. So I would say, first, most important thing, I don't think there's an age limit. There is, however, something special about the very young, where circuitry is being set up. Experience is, is a very um, strong teacher. Right? And so, so having the right experiences early, I think, can be more powerful. Um, one of my colleagues, April Benizic at Rutgers, is actually doing some auditory training using an intervention to try to get babies to cue into um, 
the, the, the timing of speech type sounds. Not necessarily speech per se, but like tones that are at the right duration to be speech-like and playing the game with it uh, to, to try to train babies who are at high risk for developing speech disorders um, in, in this particular way. So I think that there's a lot of potential even very young, these babies. She was training babies as young as three months old, which is remarkable. So, so, so far you have effectively shown or in the process of showing that you can improve saccades uh, or the performance on saccad tests. Mm -hmm. So where where would you like to go next with this? What's, what do you see as the next major step? Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. question. So, so we really want to see transfer in these different kinds of tasks. So we've seen um, effects on saccadic eye movements themselves. We've seen effects on the uh, covert manifestation of uh, saccadic eye movement in terms of uh, spatial attention shifts where your eye doesn't move. And we've seen changes in fixation behavior. Um, what I'd like to see is performance on something like a driving task or something like a manual reaction time task, a task with that you know shouldn't really have anything. You know, there, there is a manual component, but but where your gaze is, like like catching a ball or following something that's that's moving around, and then you have to grab it. You know, that some kind of uh, transition like that, and then with the social gaze task, we're actually setting it up so that again, I don't expect differences in social behavior the way, you know, noticeable in the way we interact, but I think at the fine scale, I want to be able to pick up timing differences there. You know, when something happens in the room, are you faster at looking at it? Did you, did you orient to it? more? And so those are the three levels that we're looking for. At the next stage, we really want to make these available um, we can actually send eye trackers home. They're, they work on Max NPCs now. So we would like to do a much larger study where we actually push the trackers out with very good instructions, and then people come to our website and play the games that way. Um, the, the side tracker can do that. So I think that that would be a much larger, much more um, impactful study to see you know, how, how we could do this in a much wider population range. So. Great. So that, I mean, that's a good place to wrap up. I mean, what you've, I think, illustrated beautifully is um, the nature of science, especially now that we've gotten past the low-hanging fruit, is you're trying to build an ethicist, edifice, and there's a lot of bricks that have to be put in place, and uh, it's not going to be a quick fix. You're trying to figure out these first steps, um, but it's a direction that looks promising. So, good. So, thank you. I want to thank you, and uh, especially. Thank you.